I'd like to introduce, first of all, Steve Frischman, uh, who uh, is a, a geolo geologist by education and training. Uh, but I first met Steve in 1986 in Boston for a symposium on high-level radioactive waste when the Department of Energy was doing uh, <coughs> characterization work for um, deep geological repositories in crystal and rock uh, in uh, New Hampshire and uh, Maine and, uh, and Vermont. And Steve came up from the state of Texas to share with us his work. Uh, Steve actually was principal in, prin Steve was actually principal in stopping the, uh, the uh, deep geological burial of 70,000 metric tons in uh, Deaf Smith County, Texas, <clears throat> and then went on to work for the state of Nevada. So um, uh, where we've just now seen the uh, Yucca Mountain project uh, stopped and defunded. So uh, Steve's a, 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 a nuke waste fighter from way back. And then um, we'll hear from Kevin Camps, um, who has uh, been a, a leading spokesperson on the nuclear waste issue for Beyond Nuclear. Um, Kevin is um, internationally known. Uh, he uh, was part of the, uh, a trip to Japan uh, several years ago um, that looked at uh, a number of issues, including the nuclear waste issue there in Japan. And uh, so we're looking forward to their presentations. I thought what I'd do this morning is first, uh, since Yucca Mountain, since Yucca Mountain keeps getting mentioned, uh, give you what the status is, which is not really a very pretty picture, but uh, we'll get through it. Uh, and then uh, it's just to start out, and then we'll get to it. It's not quite over, but I'll talk about why. And then I'll talk a little bit about some sort of general recommendations about transportation that have emerged uh, since we've been at this uh, from the federal government standpoint since the Waste Policy Act of 1982. And uh, we're still talking about the same transportation problems that we were talking about then. And there hasn't been a lot of advancement, but of course the promises are there. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, first, Having gotten to the point where we are in you know, the, the Yucca Mountain you know, problem, as I refer to it sometimes, you know, is you know, primarily due to the hard work of very many people. And you know, we certainly have to thank 25 years of work by activists, some in this room, many like you in this room, and without that, we wouldn't be anywhere near where we are now. So. Uh, appreciation is out there for what is really not a, a, so much a Nevada issue as a national issue, and it still needs to be uh, pushed to some type of resolution that we can all agree to rather than just someone saying this is the way it's going to be done. What we're dealing with with Yucca Mountain is sort of a combination of this morass that you've heard over the last couple of days of the mixture of policy, politics, regulatory issues, and Yucca Mountain is an enormously complicated mix of all those factors. And I think just from you know, hearing over the last day and a half about some of the arguments that are involved in all directions, you can get a feel for the complexity but it's one of these things that is moving all the time. You know, we spend most of our time watching for what the latest person is going to say today, because things shift that fast. Uh, just to sort of follow on uh, a couple of the speakers before, before we can talk about Yucca Mountain and high-level waste, we've got a few nuke speak problems to talk about. One of them is, uh, what do you call the stuff that comes out of the reactor? And you know, for years and years, the industry called it spent fuel. Uh, it's uh, meaning that it's used up. Uh, we, uh, in our community for a long time, have called it irradiated fuel because that's what it is. It's been irradiated. Uh, 
Some people call it waste, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. Well, again, it's all of this uh, sort of mindset and semantics. And the latest thing the Department of Energy has come up with that they think is neutral, so therefore it leads them in any direction that they want to go, because if you call it spent, then you've got to get rid of it and it doesn't have any more use. If you call it waste, you know, again, it's something you've got to get rid of. And the reason nobody's dealt with it or nobody did deal with it for so long is because they thought it was waste. So the Department of Energy now calls it used fuel. And that leaves all of their options open. And uh, it uh, apparently carries, in their mind, no connotation. It says everything, everything and anything is fair game again. Another one is uh, the word repository. And there have been various jokes made about that. Uh, and also, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the industry and the Department of Energy get really upset when people call it a dump. Well, that's what the people call it. And uh, there isn't any way to uh, sort of wordsmith your way around that. And the people who are now talking about used fuel, instead of using the word disposal very much, they call it disposition. And yeah, so again, these are the words that you have to sort of listen to and think about how it works and you know, who's, who, who's coming up with these new words that actually say the same thing in all of our minds. And the last one is the word performance. And performance is used throughout re Nuclear Regulatory Commission speak. And what it really means is, does whatever it is you're trying to do meet regulations? And presumption being regulations make it safe. Uh, performance, in effect, uh, uh, from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission position is that by meeting regulations, then everything is OK. Well, a colleague of mine in many, many technical meetings and policy meetings with the NRC and DOE over the years, uh, has always taken uh, some difference when you have the experts in the room from the federal agencies and their contractors saying uh, the reason we're trying to improve performance is because we don't want to exceed the limit of health effects. And this colleague of mine invariably in those meetings say, well, you're talking about a health effect for Yucca Mountain. What is a health effect for Yucca Mountain? And there's sort of silence, and she says, well, whether you agree with it or not, a health effect for Yucca Mountain under NRC regulations is a dead Nevadan. A dead Nevadan. Because the yeah, regulations have been exceeded. So, and they only count deaths. A health effect is a death. That's it in the regulatory system. All right, so now that we've cleared up nuke speak, when we all know what we're talking about in terms of how Yucca Mountain might work or not work. I think what I want to do is, since all of you are, are aware that uh, in 1987, Congress changed the law and named Yucca Mountain as the single site to be studied for uh, a national nuclear waste repository. Uh, that came after uh, a few years of trying to do a scientific screening of sites around the country which for primarily political reasons didn't work, so it was just decided in you know, you know, 1987 that primarily because of Nevada's uh, lack of representation on Capitol Hill that uh, Yucca Mountain, Nevada would be the single site to be studied. And so for 15 years, or from 1987 until 2002, the Department of Energy did what they called site characterization at Yucca Mountain. This was supposedly the in-depth studies, and it was supposed to include such things as uh, understanding a transportation system and uh, also trying to uh, prove up that Yucca Mountain would uh, meet the regulations. And we, that's a whole different story about how they got through that. But the reason it went on for 15 years is because the Department of Energy, under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act procedures, managed to get by all that time without ever making a decision about anything that they could be held accountable for. So it was 15 years of uh, 
uh, Nevada technical people, other technical people, and the public having to deal with a constant stream of the Department of Energy telling everything is going just fine. We're on our way. And uh, that so far everything looked great. And it became sort of an issue because there was only one site. The Department of Energy saw this as a challenge to make it work. Well, in 2002, under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, the Secretary of Energy uh, followed the procedure and recommended the site to the Congress and to the President for development as a repository. Uh, following that procedure, uh, the state of Nevada was allowed to uh, file a notice of disapproval, and we did. And the notice of disapproval was then up to a vote of Congress, and of course, Nevada's disapproval was overridden. So everything was on its way, and the Nuclear Waste Policy Act says that once the site is recommended to the President and the Congress and it's accepted, within six months a license application is supposed to be tendered to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to go into a licensing process that in procedure is similar to a licensing process for a new nuclear power reactor. Well, not six months later, but six years later, the Department of Energy finally produced a license application. And in the meantime, what they were doing was all the work they had not done to take it up to a license uh, or a site recommendation. And the site recommendation was done at a time when it seemed to be politically correct to do it. It looked like all the opportunities were get, to get it right. The department wasn't ready, but finally in 2008, they said they were ready. And again, uh, since there's no penalty, six months, six years, what difference does it make? Uh, the site recommendation was also made because uh, rather than sort of following the thought process that went into the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, a director of the, uh, what was called under the act, the Office of Civilian Radioactive Waste Management, which was the DOE office that was covering all this, had seen that there was an up and down in funding and commitment on the part of Congress over, the year, over those 15 years uh, about whether they really wanted to do it. So, what this director did was sort of force them into a situation where they had to go through this site recommendation process in order to get for the Department of Energy what they believed to be a commitment to developing the repository. Now, what happened after the end of those six years was that the design and essentially the concept of repository operation changed drastically, but that was okay. The license application reflected their latest thinking. Uh, in, because a license application was filed, we got into the morass of Nuclear Regulatory Commission procedures. And what the state of Nevada had to do, and some other parties who were interested uh, uh, in intervening, was we had to have contentions uh, accepted by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, contentions being objections to individual conclusions of the license application. Well, Nevada, in an unprecedented move, uh, ended up filing over 230 contentions, 230 objections to the license application. This is totally unprecedented in all Nuclear uh, Regulatory Commission licensing proceedings. If you see 25, that's a lot. So 230, uh, with other interested parties such as uh, counties in Nevada, it ended up with uh, about 300 contentions, all of which would, uh, if accepted, would have to be adjudicated in essentially a quasi-judicial uh, situation in a courtroom. Now, the, under the procedure, the Department of Energy and as the applicant and the NRC were allowed to uh, object to any of these uh, contentions. Well, the Department of Energy literally objected to every contention, wanted it thrown out. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff wanted most of them thrown out. The NRC appoints a licensing board uh, in the licensing proceeding to handle all of the procedure of it and all of the hearings and so on. The licensing board, after looking at the entire record, ended up accepting for litigation 229 of Nevada's 230-plus uh, contentions, and most of those by other parties. 
these contentions range over technical issues, legal issues, uh, and uh, uh, issues having to do with compliance with standards, with the specific EPA standards and so on, and also with the license application has to come an environmental impact statement. So the uh, issues for contentions also include the environmental impact statement, which includes transportation, which the Nuclear Regulatory Commission never likes to talk about. But because of the strange circumstances of this proceeding, the entire DOE EIS was up for grabs. Well, in late 2009, this was just uh, after all of the contentions were in, interveners were set, the contentions had been accepted for adjudication. Now, uh, late 2009, we started hearing that the Department of Energy was getting disinterested in pursuing this license application. And uh, disinterested because, um, among other things, uh, it had gone on so long, it was so contentious, and uh, the uh, Senator Reed from Nevada was the Senate Majority Leader. There was a tough election that went on just before that, if you'll remember, and uh, President Obama, as candidate, indicated that he was not particularly interested in going on with this debilitating process for decades more. So in uh, 2009, there were indications the department wanted to just withdraw. Uh, in March of 2010, the department actually filed a motion uh, with the licensing board to withdraw its license application. Well, this really started the storm. And uh, the reason for that was because they had worked on it so long, they, they, they still could not admit that there were serious technical issues, even though our contentions showed really serious technical issues. So what the Secretary of Energy said is that the site is not workable, meaning they don't believe it can be developed as a repository, meaning they don't think that uh, it can be licensed and developed without uh, just extraordinary more effort that may or may not be successful and from his standpoint likely would not be successful in the long run. Now, through time, that unworkable has become more and more a statement of uh, because of the persistent and severe opposition over years and years, which you were included in, that they, it's just not worth it for the federal government to go forward. Well, because of the, WIC, the Waste Policy Act is uh, uh, put together, this brought on a whole new sort of political legal system that went to work. Aiken County, South Carolina, where Savannah River is, uh, the state of South Carolina, the state of Washington, uh, a few individuals, the Nuclear Energy Institute, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, and even one county in Nevada, which is where Yucca Mountain is, all came in and uh, filed a lawsuit saying that under the Waste Policy Act, the Department of Energy cannot withdraw its license application, not allowed to under the law, it must proceed. Now, and the, uh, the, the licensing board had already made a similar decision saying that under federal law, it can't be withdrawn. So it went to the commission, the whole commission after the licensing board, the whole commission politically split and sort of ideologically split at the time. And there were only four members because there was one unfilled seat. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission ended up in a tie. Two thought that the withdrawal should be accepted, two thought that it should not. And that tie persisted for over a year. And uh, so we were in a total limbo. In the meantime, the Department of Energy was totally dismantling its program. It had closed out everything at Yucca Mountain, put fences over the end of the tunnel. I was one of the last people in the tunnel before it's off limits for essentially everybody. And the only resident at the time uh, was a barn owl, which uh, was encouraging. <laughs> so uh, after things were just sort of in limbo. Uh, and finally, the Department of Energy had said, 
We, we've, got clo we've closed everything out. We've disbanded the Office of Civilian Radioactive Waste Management. There's nothing there. And finally, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission had to agree that they were at a stalemate. But before that, the court didn't rule on the issue of whether the Department of Energy had the right under the law to withdraw. What they said is it's premature because the agency, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, had not taken final action. So when the Nuclear Regulatory Commission finally conceded that they had a uh, stalemate, then the court uh, was willing to entertain a further question that, would, uh, that was then a result of another suit by this same group of people was, does the Nuclear Regulatory Commission have the right to suspend the license application, which it had done when DOE shut everything down? Well, that case is still pending. All the oral arguments are in. Uh, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals has said, we'll give all of the parties until uh, December 14th of this year, which is essentially the end of this congressional session to give a status report since the program has been unfunded since 2010. The NRC is sitting there with very little money, the DOE is sitting there with very little money, and the court can't order them to spend money that they don't have. So right now what we're waiting for is the court to decide whether NRC and DOE, or NRC must go forward with the license application in the face of having very, very little money. And, that, and if they restart it, then DOE is sort of obligated to do its part, even though it doesn't want to, and they have very, very little money. And one of the arguments uh, to the court is uh, Congress has not seen fit for three years now to fund these people, you know, and to fund the project. Now, isn't it sort of a waste of money to have to restart and go just a little bit into a licensing proceeding and then stop for lack of funds when the funds run out? And that's a severe argument at this point, because in the continuing resolution that we're under now, there is no money. For the rest of FY13, after the continuing resolution, there will be no money. So we're sitting in a situation now where uh, if the court says NRC doesn't have to proceed with a license uh, uh, proceedings, then it's over, and which is what we're all hoping for. If the NRC, for some reason, or if the court, for some reason, says that the NRC must proceed under the law, then this raises, well, what's going to happen with that little bit of money? And that little bit of money is going to run out pretty quickly. There are lots of things that have to be done in order to restart this whole thing. DOE is likely to ask for a long, long continuance because they just don't have the money. They've said it's, they think it's going to take about $100 million to get restarted to the point where they can get back in to a licensing proceeding. All they've got is about $18 million of unobligated money. So even if the court, in the face of all reality, says spend your money till it's gone, I think when the money's gone, then the project is gone because we don't see any will in Congress at this point to spend new money to go forward with something where more and more of what you see in the press and statements from both industry people, government people, and the, the public and organizations like all of yours is that even if you proceed, it's not worth it because it will never get there. So that's sort of the situation now, and we're waiting to see if the court rules in December. Uh, the court could wait till the end of the uh, continuing resolution, which is uh, in March. And so they could continue the, uh, you know, just holding out, the suspension continues. And at, at some point, it's just going to grind to a halt. And you know, then the, the, the country knows that it has to get serious about a new policy for not ne necessarily nuclear waste disposal, but a new policy for overall how this country thinks about nuclear waste management, with disposal maybe being a part of that. Uh, a little bit about some transportation principles. Uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission that was mentioned uh, by, I think, Diane and Arjun, uh, has uh, made a number of recommendations, and Kevin will talk about some of those, but um, I want to go through just a few of the sort of general principles 
that they raised in their recommendations having to do with transportation, since transportation is what will affect the whole country, uh, as was pointed out, if there's uh, centralized interim storage, if there's repository, if there's both, transportation is the big issue for the majority of the people in the country. Uh, reactors are in 35 states, uh, commercial reactors. Just the transportation to a Yucca Mountain site would involve 42 states. And think about the number of communities involved in that, number of cities, even like Chicago, which, and I think uh, Kevin's going to be talking a little about that. But some of the ideas that are old ideas, but at least they've been brought forward again. And many of them have been fleshed out by work, technical work, a lot of it being done by the state of Nevada, and our reports are all public. But some of the recommendations are, seem almost simplistic. Uh, undertake full examination of spent fuel transport security by independent uh, technical experts. Well, who would think not? Be proactive in formally assuring, the managing, uh, uh, assuring and assessing and managing social risks Expand transportation external coordination working group, which is a group that's been around for a long time, largely ineffective from DOE's point of view. Now, full-scale package uh, testing. Well, we fought for years to full-scale test rather than just do parts, uh, small scale and then computer extrapolations of how transportation casts actually act in under conditions of accidents or other uh, un unexpected events. Well, again, w why not? And the NRC got into a program where they were going to do it, and then for a matter of a few million dollars and the cost of a cask, they called it off, uh, uh, at least for as long as anybody can see. DOE should continue to ensure systematic involvement of states and tribal government in decisions about routing and scheduling for waste fuel shipments. Well, again, huh? Who, who would not say that? DOE should identify and make public the suite of its preferred routes as soon as practicable to support state, tribal, and local planning and preparedness. Again, you know, this is a uh, Blue Ribbon Commission that is a federal advisory committee that is mouthing exactly the same words that all of us, just based on simple logic, said 25 years ago. DOE should fully implement its dedicated, dedicated train decision before large quantity decisions uh, are made. Well, again, rail versus highway, we know that, it, that in the 25 years our infrastructure has gotten worse. We also know that overall, if you look at just risk per mile, rail is uh, safer than highway, more predictable than highway, but the department never could exactly come down and say it will be rail or it will be highway, and that's because there is a number of reactors that don't have rail access. And if they do, getting to rail access sometimes involves barges. In one case, the DOE analyzed barges in Lake Michigan. So uh, it's not a simple decision, but it's a decision that has to be made in terms of if you know where you want to move it, then you have to at least take into account the risk factors involved. With the sort of new interest through this techno or, uh, state working group in transportation, they had a meeting recently with the Department of Energy, and there is one uh, sort of principle that finally came out of the state groups that is telling DOE that they've got to do something that they have never done before, and DOE being essentially uh, a surrogate for the industry as well. All these years, DOE has not wanted to talk about transportation for two reasons. One is it incites people like you and me because so much is more is unknown than is known. And the other is, throughout any discussion of transportation, the Department of Energy and the industry have always both said and implied in every presentation that it's so safe you shouldn't worry about it. Well, the new flavor that came from the states in this meeting that was held just like a month and a half ago 
was the states together told DOE that instead of risk denial, what you need to do is acknowledge that there are risks out there. We've all spent 25 years understanding and trying to understand both the current risks and risks having to do with new things such as higher burn up fuels and you know, you know, deteriorating infrastructure and so on. You have to acknowledge those risks and in order to gain any level of confidence at all from the people in the country, you have to acknowledge risks and say, here's the extent to which these risks are involved in specific situations as well as general situations, and then try to figure out together how those risks can be manageable. Not that they are, but try to figure out how they can be manageable so transportation uh, is understood as a risk just like all other things radioactive are understood as risk. There's no single part of it that you set aside because it's too safe to worry about. Kevin and I will probably, in the question period, uh, continue dialogue along this line. Okay. Uh, now we'll hear from Kevin Camps, Beyond Nuclear. I was asked by a little bird before the session started to touch on nuclear economics, and that certainly applies. You heard Bob Backus last night during the question and answer talk about the nuclear economics of new reactor proposals, the uh, federal subsidies of many forms, nuclear loan guarantees being key in the billions or even tens of billions of dollars, some of those nuclear loan guarantee money grabs, also construction work in progress at the state level where ratepayers are gouged, uh, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, in a pretty extreme way. There have been a number of uh, rate increases in South Carolina to build the summer nuclear power plant. So um, it applies also to radioactive waste. I mean, one of the first promises that the federal government effectively made to utility companies who were reluctant to get involved in nuclear power back in the 1950s was, we will take care of the high-level radioactive waste for you. The first study by the National Academy of Sciences on high-level radioactive waste disposal was in 1957. It was the same year as the Price-Anderson Liability Act was passed, and it was the same year that the shipping port commercial reactor fired up, the first commercial reactor in the United States. So these were some big promises, and that got enacted in 1982, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1983, when Reagan signed it, made that law. The U.S. taxpayer is ultimately responsible for the high-level radioactive waste, although there is a nuclear waste fund that is a nuclear ratepayer fund, so people getting nuclear electricity, whether they be families in their homes or businesses at their business place, they will be paying a, uh, a surcharge on their electricity bills to take care of the waste someday. So that's set aside for repositories. We'll talk more about that. Arjun actually mentioned it earlier, the, uh, the breach of contract. The Department of Energy signed contracts with the nuclear utilities that said starting in 1998, we will take out your garbage, this high-level radioactive waste. It has not happened. Incredibly, the damages to the U.S. taxpayer each and every year at this point are $500 million that the U.S. taxpayers are paying in damages for that breach of contract. So radioactive waste subsidies. Um, while the utilities are getting $500 million a year in damages, while CEOs like Jay Wayne Leonard of Entergy Nuclear are pocketing $25 million a year in compensation, uh, the waste is left at potentially catastrophic risk in the storage pools, also at risk in the dry casks. Amazing shortcuts on safety taking place. At the Millstone Unit 1 reactor, which is a Fukushima Daiichi twin in Connecticut, a Mark 1, it's been shut down since the mid-1990s, the reactor, which is great. You can't have a meltdown with a shutdown and defueled reactor. But you can have a pool fire with the high-level radioactive waste pool left uh, packed. And the reason that they're doing that is to defer the cost of dry cask storage as far into the future as possible. And a recent development within the last days or weeks is that Millstone is dramatically expanding its dry cask storage We'll talk more about the problems of dry cask storage later. So where are we at? Uh, what's next? Um, you know, to their credit, 
the Obama administration made a very wise decision to uh, end the Yucca Mountain project. Uh, it would leak massively into the environment. It would be a nuclear sacrifice area. The price tag alone is approaching $100 billion. Yes, $11 billion was spent out there already. Well, uh, all told, it would be a whole lot more than that. It makes sense to end it now. So what is Plan B? Well, that's why the Obama administration, Energy Secretary Chu, established the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future. And when we heard the name, we knew we were in trouble. <laughs> Diane mentioned it. They worried a whole lot more about fancy new reactors that were going to solve everything than really what to do about the waste a lot of the time. We had to keep reminding them what they were supposed to be about. So, you know, Obama and his people were supposed to come out with a radioactive waste statement policy in July. That's what we heard. There, was, uh, there were meetings going on. It was supposed to happen by the end of July. didn't happen. It was supposed to happen in November. It's now December 2nd. But chances are it's going to likely echo, follow the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission, which Obama and Chu established. And I just wanted to show this picture. This is Chu, I guess third from the left, and it's also Senator Durbin from Illinois, and we got the president of the University of Chicago, and we got the director of Argonne breaking ground for a new energy sciences building. This is a funner, a more, a more um, pleasurable memory of Senator Durbin, the 4th of July parade, 2000 in Evanston, when we were hauling this crazy parade float back and forth across the country. This is a full-size replica radioactive waste transportation container of the highway size. And uh, so we had a little bit of fun that day. Well, this Blue Ribbon Commission was stacked with pro-industry folks. There was not a single anti-nuclear voice on this commission. Maybe the most outrageous appointment was John Rowe, uh, CEO of Exelon. You know, if you have to hold a single person responsible for the generation of high-level radioactive waste, this is the biggest nuclear utility in the country. Well, it kind of you know, makes sense because Exelon, John Rowe, is one of Obama's biggest political supporters going back to his days as a state senator coming out of Illinois. Another outrageous uh, appointee was this individual, um, Richard Meserve, who was NRC chairman when the Davis-Bessey hole in the head fiasco took place. And his fingerprints were all over that. Uh, nearest uh, close call to a major disaster in the United States since Three Mile Island. He was also, just talking about Chicago, the lawyer for Care McGee uh, defending their contamination of West Chicago with radioactive contamination. Um, he still serves on the board of directors of two nuclear utilities, and despite that, is chair of all things nuclear at the National Academy of Sciences. But um, we were able to, uh, a coalition including Beyond Nuclear, was able to get him off of this current re uh, nuclear power and cancer incident study that he was going to be involved with because of his conflict of interest. Another uh, outrageous appointment to the Blue Ribbon Commission was uh, Senator Pete Domenici, retired, um, who was very powerful, chaired the uh, Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, also the Senate Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee, was instrumental in passing the 2005 Energy Policy Act, which $13 billion in subsidies for new reactors, um, not including the nuclear loan guarantee program, which, you know, at this point is $22.5 billion in nuclear loan guarantees, uh, $18.5 billion for new reactors, $4 billion for new uranium enrichment. Um, in 2006, he introduced a very relevant piece of legislation that we fended off by the skin of our teeth, a centralized interim storage bill. And it, it led to the hammering out of the principles for safeguarding nuclear waste at reactors, which are available in the back. Arjun Makajani coined the term hardened on-site storage in 2002 when we were opposing the Yucca Mountain proposal. So what's our alternative? Well, hardened on-site storage is our alternative. And in 2006, we put some uh, flesh on those bones of those initial visions that Arjun articulated with a statement signed by 200 environmental groups across the country. Don't do this centralized interim storage. Do hardened on-site storage. Another member of the Blue Ribbon Commission now serving as chairwoman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Allison McFarlane. Good position on Yucca. 
good position on reprocessing. One of the real victories, I would say, of the Blue Ribbon Commission was there was an effort by people like Domenici and others to resurrect reprocessing in the United States. And Alice McFarlane was a strong voice saying, no way, not a good idea. She's also really good on pool risks. She was a co-author with Bob Alvarez back in January of 03 of a major study on the risk of high-level radioactive waste pools going up in flames. Um, where is she at on reactors? Uh, our exchanges with her in southwest Michigan on Palisades have not been good. <laughs> so I think we have our work cut out for us in that regard. So what were these uh, recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission in their final report at the beginning of this year? A consent-based approach, something they lifted from the Canadian Nuclear Waste Management Organization. What does that mean? You know, does that mean uh, financial compensation that smooths the way and makes everything better? That's what we're seeing at the Bruce Nuclear Complex and at other sites across northern Ontario, Saskatchewan, that are considering volunteering for being a, a national high-level radioactive waste dump for Canada. You know, buy people out? I mean, that's one possibility for what that definition could be. Um, they also proposed at the BRC a new organization whose sole purpose was high-level radioactive waste management, not the Department of Energy, because their name is mud at this point after the Yucca Mountain fiasco. Uh, an interesting one, access to this nuclear waste fund. There are still tens of billions of dollars in the nuclear waste fund set aside for deep geologic disposal. Uh, Eleven billion dollars have been spent, eight billion of that was nuclear waste fund. The other three billion at Yucca was Department of Defense, nuclear weapons related funding. So we've had to fend that one off a lot because under the George W. Bush administration, they wanted access to the nuclear waste fund. They wanted Congress out of the way. They wanted Harry Reid out of the way. On the purse strings, Bush, Bush had been proposing budget lines per year of $2.5 billion at Yucca Mountain we would have blown through the entire nuclear waste fund under uh, the George W. Bush administration. So here are some others prompt efforts to develop another dump site, one or more dump sites, uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, Maine, Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, Upper Peninsula, Michigan, you name it. There was a report by North Carolina, you name the state, there was a, a report by George W. Bush's energy secretary, December 2008, the closing days of the administration. You look at the map of the lower 48, there was not one state that was exempt. Uh, granite was a preferred geologic medium. Uh, so was shale, ironically enough. Another aspect of the 2005 Nuclear, um, I'm sorry, Energy Policy Act is fracking. They just opened the floodgates on fracking in that bill. But they're looking at shale for radioactive waste disposal. Um, number five, uh, Consolidated interim storage, and much of the rest of my talk is going to be about this. This is their top priority. And what is driving that? As soon as the waste leaves the nuclear power plant site, it becomes the title of the Department of Energy and the liability of the Department of Energy, which means the taxpayers, transfer of liability. And then prompt efforts to prepare for large-scale transport. Uh, they want to keep uh, the U.S. a leader in terms of making the money and jobs, jobs, jobs in the nuclear industry, and also internationally. It was mentioned by Mo Heddington uh, last night in, in the questions. What about the, the, the next form of global nuclear energy partnership that continues on under Obama? The bad news on reprocessing under this Blue Ribbon Commission with Obama's name on it is it keeps things kind of where they were at. $150 million a year for reprocessing R&D, it's not the several billion per year that Bush was proposing, but it's still out there. And also these advanced new reactor designs that we want to work with other countries to sell overseas and such. So problems with pools. I mentioned fires. Uh, a fast motion drain down accident, such as dropping a heavy load. Again, at Palisades, they had a cask dangle, a 107 ton weight that dangled for two days over the Palisades pool back in October of 2005. And the workforce was so ignorant that they nearly disengaged the emergency brake. And that thing would have plunged through and punched a hole in the bottom of the pool, perhaps, drained the water away. Uh, we're seeing this uh, with our very eyes in real life at uh, Fukushima Daiichi Unit Number 4. Another big earthquake there. The entire reactor building could come down, including the pool. 
And then it's just a matter if enough of the waste is still configured together that it could be on fire within a few hours. And this is no radiological containment. Even at an uh, intact pool, the pools are outside of containment. There isn't a radiological containment structure other than this warehouse called the reactor and pool containment building. Uh, another version of that is a slower mo motion boil down where over the course of some days, perhaps, the water could boil away, evaporate away, down to the top of the fuel rods, exposing them, and they could catch on fire at that point. So for example, Hurricane Sandy, Oyster Creek Nuclear Power Plant, the reactor had been emptied into the pool for refueling, or a third of the core had been emptied into the pool, and that's very hot. And so here comes Hurricane Sandy. Uh, the grid is lost to Hurricane Sandy. There is no emergency backup power on the pools. It's not required. They're connected to the grid. Uh, the floodwaters of, of the hurricane came within six inches of the service water pump that provides cooling for essential equipment. So it was a very dicey situation just with the pool at Oyster Creek during Hurricane Sandy. Another problem with pools is leaks. We have an epidemic of leaks from pools in the United States. Indian Point into the Hudson River, uh, Connecticut Yankee into Long Island Sound, the Connecticut River. There's a half dozen pools that have leaked in the United States. But going from the frying pan into the fire, dry cask storage may be safer than pools, but it's not safe. Dry casks have not been designed to withstand terrorist attacks. Uh, there was a test carried out at Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland, tow anti-tank missile, the first missile took out the concrete radiation shielding, it turned to dust, it blew away. The second tow anti-tank missile put a hole through the dry cask uh, metal as big around as a grapefruit and all the way through 15 inches of die cast iron. This was a German cast ore cask, which is the Cadillac of dry casks. It's much thicker, the metal is much thicker than the casks in this country for the most part. So you see a couple different orientations here, the up and down orientation, is more common. The horizontal bunker looking orientation is becoming more common. Uh, that is not a security bunker. That is radiation shielding. So these are not designed to withstand terrorist attack. In fact, a lot of shortcuts are taken. Uh, Oscar Shirani, the whistleblower from Commonwealth Edison Exelon, who passed away a few years ago, uh, tragically, outed the dirt on the fact that the Holtec casks used at Dresden and other Exelon nuclear power plants and 33 reactors in the United States have no quality assurance whatsoever for the most part. He led an effort to look at the, uh, for Exelon, he looked at the fabrication, he looked at the design of these casks, and uh, there were nine major categories of, of uh, QA violation. Just one example, welding, improper welding. The welders were not certified to do their job. The materials being used were not certified. They actually rushed the cooling of the welds in cold water baths. They put fans on the welds. This introduce, introduces brittleness. So Oscar Sharani, backed up by Dr. Ross Landsman, a retired NRC dry cask storage inspector, they question the structural integrity of these casks sitting still at the reactor sites let alone in transport, and the whole techs are dual use certified for transport. So here's another, it gives you an idea how big these things are. This woman standing next to this dry cask, <coughs> at a distance of six feet, you can get a chest x-ray per hour under regulations of gamma radiation. And um, if you're right at the surface of the container, you can get 10, 10 x-rays per hour, chest x-rays per hour worth of gamma radiation. That's under regulations with everything working properly. So centralized interim storage, which we call de facto permanent, not interim, because once the waste gets somewhere in large quantities, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. We also call them parking lot dumps. So what are the top targets in the country for this top priority recommendation of the Blue Ribbon Commission. Uh, Susan Corbett's here. Savannah Riverside, South Carolina. There's a big booster club down there. They want it. They want the money. <clears throat> so that's a top target for this. This could be a regional thing. Uh, different regions could have their each one their own centralized interim storage. Another top target, the waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico. Senator Pete Domenici raised his hand. Uh, several times a meeting and said, send it to us, please, we want it. 
This is where uh, transuranic wastes from the military complex are already buried in a salt formation down there. They want to do the centralized interim storage for commercial waste on the surface, but you know what? They would not mind burying the stuff out there. And Bob Alvarez in his talk mentioned defense high-level radioactive wastes, that there's a big push to bury that there. So another top target, uh, Skull Valley Go Shoots Indian Reservation in Utah. This is called Private Fuel Storage. It's a private utility consortium pushing this. This is Margine Bull Creek, the lead opponent to the dump. And uh, we brought her up to La Crosse, Wisconsin, because Dairyland uh, Power at the La Crosse Boiling Water Reactor was the front, the front utility for this proposal. But behind that was XL Energy of the Twin Cities in Minnesota really pushing this thing, and a dozen other utilities. <coughs> the bad news is that the Nuclear Racism Commission, as I dubbed them after they licensed this uh, proposal back in 2006, did issue that construction and operating license out there for 40,000 tons, uh, about two-thirds of what exists in the United States to be parked out there. Um, but an amazing coalition of Mormon Republican politicians and wilderness groups and environmental groups and traditional Indians and anti-nuclear groups got together and a federal wilderness area was created around the reservation blocking the laying of the train tracks. These would be whole tech casks, 100 tons in weight, traveling by train out to Utah, blocked it with uh, the first wilderness in Utah in a generation. And uh, the danger though is that they could take it out there by train. They'd have to build a transfer facility, which is a task, put it onto heavy haul trucks for the last 30 miles down to the reservation. That's the danger right now under this push for centralized interim storage. Here are some other uh, Native American women who have stopped dumps. Uh, Rufina Marie Laws at Mescalero Apache, which was targeted before Skull Valley Go Shoots. She stopped that dump. Uh, Winona LaDuke has for decades now gone across the country stopping these dumps. Um, and this quote is Winona LaDuke, she said, for over 50 years, the best minds in the nuclear industry have been hard at work looking for a solution to the radioactive waste problem. And they finally found one. Haul it down a dirt road and dump it on an Indian reservation. That's their solution. And this is Grace Thorpe, who uh, fought 60 of these dumps off, starting with her own at the Sac and Fox Indian Reservation in Oklahoma. And I, I found this moment very moving. Uh, Barack Obama for Women's History Month, March of 2009. He'd just been in office for a month, really. Now read this. Grace Thorpe, another leading environmental advocate, also connected environmental protection with human well-being by emphasizing the vulnerability of certain populations to environmental hazards. In 1992, she launched a successful campaign to organize Native Americans to oppose the storage of nuclear waste on their reservations, which she said contradicted Native American principles of stewardship of the earth. She also proposed that America invest in alternative energy sources such as hydroelectricity, solar power, and wind power. So President Barack Obama put Grace Thorpe on the same level as uh, Rachel Carson in this statement. And incredibly enough, uh, I read this to the Blue Ribbon Commission at their first meeting in early 2010, and I said, you can't target Native Americans anymore with this stuff. And guess what? They sure are. Native Americans are mentioned throughout their final report. Centralized interim storage, Skull Valley Go Shoots has a license. Um, I wanted to share this because it's the 70th, uh, Kay doesn't like the use of the word, anniversary. It's 70 years at 3.25 p.m. today since Fermi created the world's first self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction, the first high-level radioactive waste. How was the news communicated to the Manhattan Project from here? Well, Compton, who was here, this was Fermi, right, Italian. He says, uh, Compton says by phone, the Italian navigator has landed in the new world. Conant, who may have been in Washington, D.C., or may have been at Harvard, who is the chairman of the National Defense Resource Committee, says, oh, and how were the natives? And Compton replies, very friendly. This was the impromptu code by which was communicated the, uh, the success of the chain reaction at the University of Chicago that day. I can't hear you. Very friendly. The natives were very friendly. One minute left. Oh, I've really blown my time. I'm sorry. 
Dresden Nuclear Power Plant I want to mention because there, there is uh, thousands of tons of waste at those three reactors here in Morris, Illinois, not counting the GE Morris reprocessing facility, uh, another 772 tons. This could be a target for centralized interim storage. So what can you do? That was supposed to be my message. Um, write to your U.S. Senators, write to your U.S. Representative, this has to be stopped. Write to your President, this has to be stopped. We have action postcards where you can write them a postcard. Beautiful art, may get their attention. I didn't talk about the Deep Geologic Repository, perhaps we can during the Q&A. This is a proposal at the Bruce Nuclear Complex in Ontario, first starting with so-called low and intermediate level radioactive wastes to bury it less than a mile from the shore of Lake Huron. But right behind that is proposals in that same place for high-level radioactive waste dumps, probably the same dump. Why are you going to spend billions or tens of billions of dollars to build a dump for low and intermediate, and then a few miles up the road build a second dump for billions or tens of billions of dollars for high? There's going to come a point where those dumps become one, in my opinion. And there's other places in northern Ontario, Saskatchewan, targeted for the high-level waste. So how, what can you do about that? this threat to the Great Lakes. Again, the postcards, we've been sending those to Canadian officials, and we actually got a Toronto Star, I believe it was, newspaper article. What are these Americans sending postcards to the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency for? What's this about? So we need to send them some more postcards. So uh, I, I really blew my time. Um, I, I just wanted to show this one. Um, what are some of the dangers of transportation? Uh, Chicago Institute of Arts, there is a train line a quarter mile away. Hundreds or thousands of these high-level radioactive waste trains could go right past there, downtown Chicago. Steve mentioned the barge shipments on Lake Michigan that are proposed from Palisades and Point Beach and Kiwani on Lake Michigan. One of those barges goes down in the lake, water gets into the container, you could have a nuclear chain reaction on the bottom of Lake Michigan. Uh, the security risks, tow anti-tank missiles uh, could take out these transportation containers. They're not designed to withstand them. Uh, even if nothing goes wrong, these shipments are giving off gamma radiation to people close by. And we have bills. Another thing you can do with the action postcards or with your own members of Congress is to oppose this bill. This would enact centralized interim storage. And we can put the uh, bill numbers back up. I hope you'll in indulge me in a couple of rapid fire questions here. How much radiation is coming off of these trucks? I mean, if you're parked, if you're stalled in traffic and you're sitting next to one, you're going to get dosed, right? The same dose rate as the dry casks. It's a chest x ray per hour at six feet, it's uh, 10 chest x rays per hour at uh, the surface. Holy cow. Um, I don't remember the figure. Okay, and really quickly, like, and you may have had this one of your slides you didn't get to, how many truckloads are we looking at in, to move just the 70,000 tons? Is there somebody got a number on how many truckloads that is? I've got the, uh, the numbers for Illinois in my slides, and I'll put them up on the screen there. But it's, uh, if they go mostly rail, because the rail are much bigger containers, that's uh, thousands of shipments to move the first 63,000 metric tons, which was the limit at Yucca. And it's... Um, if they go with uh, trucks, it's tens of thousands of shipments. Tens of thousands of truckloads. Tens of thousands of truckloads. Okay. Um, also, Steve, is there a good location where you have succinctly spelled out the technical reasons why Yucca didn't didn't make it? Because, you know, I get into arguments with people, and they always insisting it's political, and I try to say it's. Do you have is your website sh talk about the technical reasons why it was denied? Yes. If you go to uh, www.state dot nv dot us slash nuke waste n-u-c w-a-s-t-e you'll find sections there on all of the technical problems with yucca mountain the legal problems with yucca mountain uh, there was just a paper published very recently that is about 10 pages describing the uh, in simplest terms the technical problems but also on that page is the 50-page technical notice of disapproval that we submitted to the Congress in 2002, and not much has changed in terms of technical problems since then. Okay. So that, that webpage is uh, useful and also 
uh, on that subject, on our webpage, there's a section called What's News, which has U.S. and world nuclear news clips every day. So uh, that, that becomes uh, a place where actually uh, many of us look at that with our email in the morning and we found out the Department of Energy, we've been doing this for years, we found out the Department of Energy was stopping to visit us every morning too. Thank you. And finally, thank you for indulging me uh, as someone who pre presented at the BRC twice, and this is a, an issue that's very near and dear to my heart. Kevin, can you talk briefly about this consent process? What do you think the pathways to consent will be? Because as a, as a state that's looking at getting this waste at Savannah River, I'm looking at ways to plug up areas, holes where the cons it could be contrived as consent. Will you give me your best estimate for those of us who have this what are areas that should be plugged up and to, sh to, to not represent consent in this process? Then I'll go sit down. Okay. Before I forget to, I wanted to explain these numbers. These are from the uh, Yucca Mountain Final Environmental Impact Statement by the Department of Energy, February 2002. What they mean, if they went the mostly truck route, which they did not do, but they keep changing their minds, like Steve said. So that's the total number of shipments through Illinois, 38,500 only 5,300 of which originate within Illinois. So that's what that second number is. Total shipments, first number is originating within the state. So you can see the vast majority comes from out of state and passes through on the way out to Yucca Mountain. Same for the rail, uh, 7,000 shipments all told and only 861 from Illinois. So um, yeah, uh, consent-based um, and Brenane, definitely talk to Brenane about what consent-based has meant at Kincardine. Uh, the money has been flowing for several years to the tune of millions of dollars, I believe. Kincardine in um, Ontario has been bought off. And the one I'm more familiar with is the uh, private fuel storage at Skull Valley Go Shoots, where uh, the disputed tribal chairman, Leon Baer, the, the rumored amount of money from the Nuclear Utility Consortium was $50 million to $200 million was being offered to the tribe, but to Leon Bear. Supporters of the dump would get a cut of the money. Opponents to the dump were not only not given any of that money, he even cut off federal funds that they were due. And he got in trouble for that legally, actually. So Marjean Bull Creek and Sammy Black Bear were uh, being cut off from federal funds they were due. They were threatened with excommunication from the tribe. So uh, that was consent at private fuel storage. And these booster clubs that whip at Savannah River site, that's what's blinding them is the dollar signs that they hope will flow their way. Let, let me add something onto that with uh, a, a sort of a sequence that we spend a lot of time trying to get the Blue Ribbon Commission to understand and agree to, and they, they understand it. They didn't express it very well in their report, but uh, as Arjun was saying, is we need to stand away from citing for a while. We also need to take the understanding that all of us, including many people at DOE now have, that DOE should not be part of this anymore. And we, they shouldn't even be let in the door to begin the first little piece of it, which uh, some of them would like to do and some members in Congress would like them to do. The sequence should be, first, simultaneously Congress developing an approach to a new waste management organization and the way to fund it. Second, we know uh, partly because uh, the Nevada still maintains two held in abeyance lawsuits uh, against NRC and EPA. We know we need new uh, yeah, safety standards and environmental standards and licensing regulations for a repository and possibly also for new uh, or any regional or national consolidated uh, facility. Then the siting, uh, the, the new organization needs to come up with very clear siting criteria. And a lot of that will be negative, things that you don't want to do because we do have a history of understanding what we don't want to do. Once the organization is in place, that is then the time for people who, and communities who know exactly what the ground rules are, given the opportunity to think about it in their own terms. 
but sighting should be last in the list of new things rather than first. Hi, my name is Ed Smith. I'm with the Missouri Coalition for the Environment. And for those of you who missed Kay Dry's speech yesterday, all of the uranium used in the first self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction was purified in St. Louis, where we're still dealing with cleaning up waste that were spilled, dumped, and left all over our, our nice city. Um, question is, when Hurricane Sandy hit Oyster Creek, the, the number one backup plan to cool the spent fuel pool was to use a fire hose. And um, I'm, I'm curious if there's a, there are actionable items we can do to encourage our regulators, if they're not already looking at ways to better secure the spent nuclear fuel pools or irradiated fuel pools uh, at our nation's nuclear reactors besides uh, moving to dry cask storage. Are there other things we can do to uh, secure those pools? Thanks. Well, Kevin can say more on this, but the NRC has recognized that, uh, and as Arjun pointed out, and I think others too, that the first thing you need is to have a sustained and reliable source of electricity for to operate the pool. And uh, we've seen what a lack of that can do almost instantly. Yeah, Fukushima Daiichi, uh, unit number four, I mean, m multiple units, they didn't know the situation of the pools. For the first weeks, the official theory was that unit number four had experienced a radioactive waste fire in the pool. And I would have to say the jury's still out. They've backpedaled on that. They've said that, no, that's not what happened. The water remained in the pool. They didn't know that in the first days, and that's why the helicopter drops of water. They were desperately, with crowd control riot cannons, trying to fire water into the pools, <clears throat> because the thing is, once the pools are empty or even down to the tops of the fuel rods, uh, that's very, very deadly levels of gamma radiation in the pool area. You can't approach the pool. They couldn't simply run up there with a hose like they were proposing at Oyster Creek once the water was gone. And I heard a Department of Energy spokesman, this was May of 2011, and he said the possibility was that a section of the pool may have caught on fire because there's walls in the pool, there are subsections in the pool. Maybe that's what boiled dry. So. Uh, Paul and others led an effort in April of 2011, a month after Fukushima began, an emergency enforcement petition under 10 CFR 2.206 to force the NRC, demand of the NRC, that it require emergency uh, backup power on the pools to run the cooling systems to prevent the boiling away in the first place. And Dave Lockbaum at Union of Concerned Scientists has long uh, pointed out that once the boiling begins, that's a lot of steam. And the pool, especially in Mark 1's, is in the reactor building. That, that condensing steam is going to short circuit uh, safety critical electrical systems. You don't want the, boil, the, the boiling to begin. At uh, the biggest Mark 1 in the world, Fermi unit number 2, as big as Fukushima Daiichi units 1 and 2 put together, the time to boiling beginning is 4 hours and 12 minutes. That's how soon it's going to start. So in addition to the backup power, um, even NRC staff has acknowledged the need for emergency makeup water, perhaps a little more organized than a fire hose being found at the last second to run into the pool area. So um, maybe Paul could say a few words about where that emergency enforcement petition is at. The, um, the NRC has recognized uh, uh, the makeup water as their primary goal, and that's part of the order right now. So they're focusing more on putting water back in after it's boiled off than preventing the boiling. The, the, the actionable items in the petition are under review, supposedly, by the NRC, but they're on no timeline, which is, this is the problem. You, you can enter into the process, but it's endless. You know, the, it just, you know, it's just talk. And that's how they engage the public on a lot of these issues. And could I just close with the slide on hardened on-site storage? One of the key elements of hardened on-site storage, and be sure to grab the principles, is empty the pools. And, you know, some groups that are not explicitly anti-nuclear have signed on to this thing, and their position is empty the pools to low-density storage configurations like they were designed for in the first place. And as the Alvarez and McFarlane et al. study in 2003 pointed out, even with a drain down, the air circulation alone might be enough to cool uh, 
a low density configuration in a pool. Uh, so that's the first thing. The pools are approaching the density of an operating reactor core in the United States. They have to take extraordinary measures to prevent nuclear criticalities in the pool on a normal day. Uh, metal sleeves of impregnated metal with boron to prevent neutron flow. Boric acid in the pool water to absorb neutrons. So the pools have to be emptied or at, at the very least thinned into much better dry casks. Okay, I'm, I'm going to start getting the wrap-up sign here pretty soon, so we got to keep our questions and comments tighter. Uh, my name is Glenn Carroll, and I'm coordinator of Nuclear Watch South, and we're headquartered in Atlanta, and I want to echo your emotion, and um, yes, we need to make a national priority as a movement, and the example of Fukushima Pool 4 says it, you know, empty those pools and do dry cask. I have a couple of comments you may want to respond to and a question. I want to key what you raised about the DOE changing their reference to um, spent nuclear fuel, which is a legal term that's used in the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, and their use of the term used fuel, having lived with, as what Diane um, talked about, they absolutely just changed the name of all the tank waste at Savannah River site from high level waste, which is in the Nuclear Waste Policy Act to waste incidental to reprocessing, which has no legal designation and is going into concrete and staying on site instead of glass in a repository. And so I think they're up to something and you may want to comment on that, but I want to flag to you that when we try to be more descriptive of nuclear waste by changing the terminology, we need to keep in sight there is a legal definition and it could bite us in the you know what. Um, I want to um, key for everybody, there's such an awesome um, array of national talent in the room, that TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, is fixing to undertake a massive dry cask program, and it's only to alleviate space in the pools. We're in conversation about doing better and reducing the density in the pools as a goal. And uh, they actually said that's a recoverable cost, so the utility doesn't have barriers against doing that. If we can get going, and with TVA already going in that direction, I think we can. But they want to use whole tech casks. And so we really do you know, need to ride this wave, but we really have an opportunity maybe to help TVA be an example, which would be kind of a first, and um, a good example. So, um, you know, you may want to comment on that spent fuel t term, but my question is to um, Kevin, and um, Southern Company was a leading uh, utility in the consortium for private fuel storage, and they actually got out of the consortium, and so did the other biggest utility. But private fuel storage holds a license now, and so I don't think it's a dead issue, and if you can say quickly what we should be on guard against. Well, Glenn did amazing work to get Southern out of private fuel storage and folks like, yep. Uh, John Block and Deb Katz up in the Northeast got utilities out of the consortium and a bunch of us got arrested at Cook Nuclear Power Plant in Michigan to put the heat on them about it. It's not dead. I mean, they could, the, the danger scenario at private fuel storage to my mind is that haul it out there by train build an intermodal transfer facility, put it on heavy haul trucks for that final 30 miles. And it's sort of like what they did at the waste isolation pilot plant. To my mind, it was illegal what they did to get their foot in the door out there. They, uh, the state of New Mexico had say over uh, mixed waste, so plutonium contaminated, but with toxic chemicals too, and the state could control that and say, no, not yet. So they found pure plutonium wastes at NASA. I thought WIP was supposed to be about military. So truth be told, is NASA involved in the military? They found the Cassini plutonium wastes and they got their foot in the door at WIP. So they could do that at private fuel storage. They could get a single truck cask out there. They could even, to my mind, do that with a smaller sized container. They could get an amendment from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to instead of using a Holtec 100 ton cask, use some other cask and just drive it out there on the interstates and plunk it down and call it a done deal. You know, what are you gonna do now? So it's very much not a done deal. It's not over, I'm saying. Um, we've got to be very vigilant. And uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the top targets to my mind, because they already have that license. OK, to not cut too deep into our lunchtime, let's keep our questions short and comments short. This is a short one. I'm curious, 
about has there ever been any studies on what's going on with the people who handle these casks and who are close to the process, uh, both in terms of immediately and long term, how long do they work at that? Uh, very quickly, the only the, the only thing we have sort of looking into the future is the environmental impact statement for Yucca Mountain and the surface handling, waste handling facility. The two highest occupational doses in the entire operation at the surface facility of the repository, one, the personnel who handle the unloading of the arriving casks, the other is the personnel who handle uh, taking the casks, uh, the uh, storage casks that will be arriving and putting them into a large uh, uh, private fuel storage type storage facility. The people who handle the casks, both arriving and placing into storage, are the two highest occupational doses in the operation. France, you know, nuclear France, the poster child for how things nuclear should be done, right? In the 1990s, it was discovered that a quarter to a third of all the shipments going into La Hague reprocessing facility were contaminated externally above permissible doses, many times at the 500 times permissible dose level, in one case up to 3,000 times. So it wasn't just the workers and the inspectors and the train conductors, but it was uh, innocent members of the public standing on uh, train platforms as these things went by. And uh, we've had, as Bob Halstead, who now runs the State Agency for Nuclear Projects in Nevada, has documented, we've had 50-some documented external contamination incidents in the United States just up until 1996. So that's another, another source of gamma radiation for workers and others. OK, I'm, we're, we're just going to take the next two. And Hi, yeah. I'm Carol Isant. I co-chair a newly formed organization, the Alliance to Halt Fermi 3 in the Detroit area. Thank you. Um, we're dedicated, obviously, to stopping the construction of the newly proposed Fermi 3 as well, shutting down the existing Fermi 2. My question is for Kevin. You asked uh, someone to ask you about the waste confidence decision last year, and I'd like to know how we can use that decision to our advantage and what the what other little trick bags we might need to be aware of in our, in, uh, as we develop our campaign. Also, just a quick note, uh, we are bringing Harvey Wasserman into the Detroit area next Friday. So if anyone is interested in more information about that, see me over lunch. Thanks. I think, I think you need to just refer them to all the stuff that's on the current web pages because it's too much to talk about. Yeah, one yeah. Minute. I have some slides in here about waste confidence. It was a huge uh, grassroots environmental victory won by folks like Diane Curran representing four environmental groups. It, it said the nuke waste con game is over. The D.C. Circuit Courts of a, Court of Appeals said, NRC, uh, you might want to do an environmental impact statement on the on-site storage of high-level radioactive waste the most dangerous substance humankind has ever generated. So NRC is doing an environmental impact statement some 50 years into commercial nuclear power in the United States. And what that means effectively is for the next two years, NRC cannot finalize any licenses, not a, another new reactor license proposal can't be finalized, not another uh, old reactor license extension for 20 years can't be finalized. They can take the proceedings up to the brink of finalization, but until this thing is done, and what it means is we have to have a groundswell of public comments by January 2nd into the NRC. They are now rushing the process shamelessly. They took 50 years to get to an environmental impact statement under court order. Now they're giving us some weeks to comment on what we think the scope of the proceedings should be. And I had a few um, ideas for what people could say to them, and that would be uh, your Federal Register notice was legally deficient. You need to withdraw it, correct it, and put it back out again. You need to uh, identify what your proposed action is, what your preferred alternative is. What our preferred alternative is, is stop making it. That's to prevent the generation of any more waste for what exists, hardened on-site storage, and certainly the scope should be accidents, attacks, and leaks in pools and dry casks. 
So um, you can talk to me at the table about that. And before we close, um, perhaps Keegan can abuse his role as moderator to say more, but we have this uh, statement here from Huron, Ohio, where Coalition for Nuclear Free Great Lakes had a convergence October 4 to 6. Yes. We already have hundreds of signatures on this thing. If you as an individual, if you as an organization would like to sign this, please do. I have it. I may hand it back to Keegan, but sign on to this thing and we will get it to Congress. We'll get it to the White House. We're trying to stop. The main gist of it is we're trying to stop these radioactive waste dumps on the shores of the Great Lakes. This is an open-ended thing as opposed to the NRC date, which is January 2nd on nuclear waste confidence. Go ahead, Steve. Steve's going to give a website really yeah, quick. Yeah, Dave said people wanted to hear the URL for the state website one more time. It's www.state.nv.us forward slash nuke waste, N-U-C-W-A-S-T-E forward slash again.